Jesus, we, we come before you as your children. Uh, and God, we confess we, we do not have it fully together. Uh, we worry about things that, that we shouldn't worry about because you've already told us that you've taken care of it. Uh, we want things that, uh, that we shouldn't because you already told us that it's not good for us. Uh, God, uh, we're, we desire, Lord, just to walk our own path because we're too stubborn to yield to you. But, Lord, we want to take our eyes off of those things. And we want to recenter ourselves to be able to hear your voice speaking to us, guiding us, leading us, revealing to us your desire, your heart. God, it is our desire to experience freedom in you. So Holy Spirit, come. Reveal yourself to us in a tangible way. Allow us to be able to experience your presence. Allow us to be able to know who you are. God, I pray for myself. May I not simply be a speaker of your word, because, Lord, you know that's so easy. But, Lord, it is my desire that I live out your truth, your word in my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, 2014 was such an exciting year for me. Uh, it was a year filled of hope, uh, filled of wonder, filled of mystery, filled of excitement. Uh, because in 2013, we experienced one of the most uh, painful experiences of my own personal life, and that was uh, we went through a church split uh, in the last church that I pastored in. And in 2014, it was the beginning of a new era in my life. It was almost as if I was finally beginning to step to the plate and fully actualize and realize my full potential, my full purpose, my full worth in Christ Jesus. In 2014, um, around February, I received a phone call from uh, the dean of Lyons Theological Seminary, which is the seminary that I graduated from. Uh, I've known the dean for a number of years. Uh, he was my professor in undergrad as well, uh, before he became the dean of the seminary. And he gave me a phone call, and he said, Ron, how are you doing, buddy? You, you surviving over there? And I said, yes. And he said, hey, I, got a, I have an offer for you. Um, I want you to come up uh, to take over the Chinese studies program. <laughs> I, I, at first, I, I, I couldn't believe myself. I'm like, what are you, stupid? I'm a mess right now. And, and so I said to him gently and, and calmly, I said, you know, I'm not sure if I'm the right person for the position. Um, right now, especially with everything that's going on in my life, um, you know, with the church, I'm not sure if it's the right time to leave. And he said, okay, you know. Um, in March, uh, the intern senior pastor approached me. We were driving up to... Uh, the seminary, because he wanted to look at the seminary. And we had a conversation. And he basically asked me, so Ron, what do you want to do with your life? He said to me, Ron, you do not belong here. <laughs> Why are you a youth pastor here? And I knew what he was saying because I knew I didn't belong there. I knew that the day I got there, I wanted to leave. And he, he said to me, so what do you really want to do, Ron? And I said, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel torn between two things. I, I want to teach in seminary, and I, I, I want to plant a church. <laughs> and then he looked at me in this crazy way that he has a way of looking and the funny way that he has in saying, so why do you do both? And I thought he was joking at first, and we were talking and as the conversation began, we were visiting the seminary. Next thing you know, I ended up in the office of the dean of the seminary again, now with the intern senior pastor and his wife and the dean. And the dean basically said to me, Ron, why don't you, you know, what's up? We're talking, next thing you know, the, the intern senior pastor said, because he was also the president of the Chinese Church Association for the Alliance Church, at that time. And so he basically said to the dean, I think Ron's a good candidate for the position uh, of taking over the Chinese studies program. 
And then they're both looking at me. I'm looking at them, and I said, you know, Ron offered me this position <laughs> four weeks ago. And we thought that it was the right path to do because what it does, it began to set me a course of something so new. I started my doctoral studies. I took over the Chinese studies program. I began to teach in seminary, and I was beginning to get ready to be a church planter. Not only was that happening, <laughs> we were expecting our first child. So 2014 was, was a year full of hope, full of excitement, full of I have fully met my potential as finally somebody is recognizing how good I really am. Then you fast forward to uh, 2018. I was at a district conference for our denomination, and I, I get to see all my old friends, and, you know, we often joke around a lot because we don't really get a chance to see each other. You know, truth is, pastors really have no friends, and even the friends that they have are pastors. They're too busy for each other. So we really only get to see each other maybe once or twice a year at best. And we're talking, and they asked me the question, Hey, Ron, how's the church plant going? And when they asked me this question, all of a sudden, the only response I could give was, you know, uh, it's going. And I realized that that was the response I gave to a lot of people. Uh, my sister-in-law would ask me the question, how's the church plant going? i said, say, well, you know, it's going. My parents would ask me the question, they're not even Christians. How's the church plant going? I'm like, well, you know, going, surviving, you know, grinding it through. I didn't realize that what was happening was that I was a victim of shame. That my response was because I was attacked by shame. I was victimized by shame. And it caused me to want it to avoid the conversation. Because I once felt like a superstar, and I thought that I was on a trajectory to be a superstar. But over the years, I felt that I was not good. And every time when people ask me about church planting, I realized that over the last uh, three, four years that we planted this church, that I have been a victim of shame. Shame is a very powerful thing. Uh, for those of us who grew up in an Asian-based family, we would know that it is the weapon of choice in motivating us and conforming us to, quote, quote, being the good child. Uh, we know what that looks like and we know what that tastes like because it is commonly and often used as a weapon of motivation to change us, to conform us to the image and the desire in which our family wants us to live out. But shame, if you're not an Asian, uh, you may think you do not know shame, but you do. Uh, because shame is such an ingrained part of us as humanity. Uh, because shame is so ingrained, because it is a weapon, it is the weapon of choice of the enemy. Uh, we often think that uh, uh, the enemy likes to use temptations of lust and all these other different things of, of, of money and of material to get at us. Uh, but the most deadly weapon that the enemy loves to use and the weapon of choice that the enemy wants to use is shame. Because it is the first weapon that he used to assault the first humans. I want us to take a look at uh, Genesis chapter 3. Most of us know Genesis chapter 3 very well. We know it's the fall of Adam and Eve. But we often do not take in light of the context of the story that the author is trying to tell us. Because before we've been set off in chapter 3, we have to read the verse before chapter 3. And that is in verse 25, and it says, Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. And then all of a sudden, we begin to see how this unfolds. We're told in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the tree in the garden. But God said, But God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, 
and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was there with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the true tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me gave me some of the fruit and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. And so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offsprings and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he says, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Curse is the ground because of you. Through the painful toils, you will eat food from it. All the days of your life, it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return from the ground, and since from it you are taken. From dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all living things. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord said to them, This man had now become like for us, knowing what is good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hands and take also from the tree of life and eat. Live forever, so that the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had take, been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. As the, narr as the author of Genesis unpacks for us, he wants, first and foremost, to help us to understand that shame was not a byproduct of the curse. Most of us think that. Because shame already took place when the serpent entered into the arena of the Garden of Eden. We are told that when God created Adam and Eve, they were naked and they knew no shame. And here it is, we're told that the serpent or the devil the, or Satan was more crafty or more wiser or, in other words, more superior than all the other beings. That he came and he used the weapon of shame. Uh, you may ask me, how? Take a look at this passage here that we're about to see. Look at what the, the serpent is doing. By using shame, this is what the serpent does. He causes Eve to doubt her identity. We're told in, in Genesis chapter 2 that they were made in the likeness of God. That they are made in the likeness of God. And here it is, the, uh, the, the enemy is right now changing the narrative, changing the story to cause doubt in Eve that she was made in the likeness of God. Because look at this. This is what the enemy says. He says, God knows that if you eat from the tree, the fruit, you will be like God. That's a big problem here. 
that statement is not true because they are already like God. They were made in God's image. And so if we think about it, then the, the subtleness of Shangin, it does this. The weapon of Shangin, when Shangin comes, it begins to cause us to doubt the narrative, the true narrative of our life, the true story of our life. Uh, what is the true story of our life? The true story of our life is that we are made as a child of God. And as a child of God, we have authority, we have purpose, we have identity. We belong to a family. That's a true narrative. But everything that the enemy does is to assault that narrative, to cause us to doubt that narrative. Because what the enemy did with you was to make her feel that she was not good enough, that she was not complete. She wasn't where she needed to be at. Isn't that so much like shame? Shame causes us to doubt the true story. It, 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 it basically warps the narrative that we see. How often do we see that in other people? Uh, we, we, we see that in people that often uh, feel as if they've been slighted by somebody. Right? Like, take an example. <laughs> Later on, you're going to go outside and, you know, you're going to huddle around outside and all of a sudden you walk out and you say hi to somebody, but the person didn't hear you. Right? But all of a sudden now shame comes and it begins to develop this narrative. Oh, they didn't say hi to you because you're really not good enough. There's something wrong with you. They really don't like you. Oh. You see how it changes the narrative? Or how about husbands and wives? Oh, the reason why your husband didn't wash the dishes is because you're not a good wife. That's why he doesn't respect you. He doesn't listen to you. He doesn't see you. He doesn't see that you're good. Because if he did, he would pay attention to that. Whoa. Could be an alternative. Maybe he is just lazy, right? I mean, husbands have a tendency to just be lazy. But you see how shame comes in and begins to distort the narrative, the story. It changes the reality, and it makes us feel that there's something wrong with me, right? There's a big difference between shame and guilt. Guilt is, I feel bad because I did something bad. Shame is, I feel bad because I am bad. That's the narrative. And right here, we see it in play. Even before the curse took place, the enemy was using shame to assault Eve. The shame causes us to doubt our narrative, our true narrative, the true story of who we are, because Eve right now feels, oh my goodness, I am not like God. What he told me was a lie. I thought I was made in God's image, but now I am not. If I'm not made in God's image, if I'm not like God, then there's something wrong with me then. Because I thought that, that, that I thought I was... I was given this garden to, to be a part of it, to take care of it. Now, I'm not. This feeling of, of falling short, this feeling of it's not meeting up, not good enough. And then we begin to see it unfold even more. We know that what happens was because the assault took place and it changed the narrative, Shame had already begun to take a soul because it was tearing down the very fiber of her identity. And she ate it. And now here comes the after effect of shame. She realized, her and Adam realized that they were naked and they hid. Many of us don't realize this, but shame causes us to want to hide. 
Have you ever had conversations where all of a sudden you just really don't want to talk about it? They're like me. You know? When people ask me about church, I really don't want to talk about it. And the reason I don't want to talk about it is because I feel I'm not good enough. How about you? What are the things that cause you to want to hide? Because most of us believe that shame is like a slap across the face. You'll see it coming. What I wanted to tell you is this, is shame is deadly and silent. It's like the devil. It doesn't want you to know it exists in you. It does not want you to know that you've been victimized by shame. It does not want you to know that you've been assaulted by it. Shame causes us to want to hide. Want to be alone. We don't want to talk about things. We don't want people to know, quote, quote, the real things that's happening underneath the surface. Because if they knew, if they knew, then it will make us even feel even worse because then it validates the reality of how good we really are not. Shame causes us to want to hide. That's why shame causes us to want to avoid community. Shame causes us to, to wanting to isolate ourselves from people. Shame causes us to want to break relationships with people. Shame causes us to want to run away from people. Because it wants us to hide. It wants us to live in the lie that I'm not good enough. It wants us to hide in it, stew in it, sit in it, live it, believe it. It's scary, isn't it? The only way to fully expose shame in order for freedom or healing to take place is to come out of hiding. Because look what happens. And God comes in and he calls for Adam and Eve and he says, where are you? Where are you? God is pursuing this is a statement that God has been pursuing humanity. Where are you? And this is what Adam and Eve says. They said to God, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. They began to call out what really took place. They began to step forward out of their shame. And when we fast forward to the latter verses later on after the curse, God kills an animal and he covers them with it. And that's the foreshadow of Jesus Christ covering us. And so what this tells us about shame is very simple. That the only way to defeat shame is to bring it to the surface, to bring it to the light, because shame wants us to isolate. It wants us to run away. It wants us to hide that nobody knows. But the only way in order for Christ to actually cover it is for shame to be fully exposed to the surface. That's the only way that shame can be defeated. That's the only way that the power and the grips that shame has on you will change. Because shame paints a very powerful narrative in our life that we believe. Right? If you're Asian, there's a very high level of percentage that you don't feel that you're very good. You can have all the accolades and you can make all the money there's always something that you feel about yourself that you feel that is 
not good. Right? There's always something else you need to climb. You know, for some of us, it may be. In order for me to feel good about myself, I need then to pursue the success that I've been shamed of to do. Whether it's to have a high-profile career, uh, but even when we have a high-profile career, then it's not enough because we're not a vice president, president, CFO, whatever. Oh, we're not certified. We don't have all these things. If we become a doctor, then we're not a fellow. If we're not a fellow, we're not board certified. If we're not board certified, then we're not one of these renowned things. There's always something else to chase. If, 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 if it's a simple thing of, of uh, your validation as a husband and wife, well, I'm not good enough because if I was a better husband, uh, then my wife would actually treat me in a way that is a little more proper. She will respect me. Uh, she will uh, listen to what I have to say. She won't look down at me as if I'm a nobody. Uh, for a wife, to, well, if I was good enough, then, then my husband will actually see me and not always have their eyes on the screen or on the phone. That's the narrative we paint to ourselves. Because it is the narrative of shame. The narrative of shame when we're in the context of community and we tell ourselves, nobody really wants to talk to me. Nobody really wants to know me. Nobody really cares for me because I'm not good enough. I'm awkward. There's a little defect in me. There's a little something about me that if it was exposed, people wouldn't want to know that. There's another thing about shame that we do not realize, that when shame paints a narrative, there's two things that will take place. One, we can become very extremely angry, and we know what anger is. Anger is our protector because we really don't want to face the pain that we really feel, and so we become very angry. And then after our anger, we then begin to run to either our escapes or our managers. Right? For some of us who run through our escape, it would be pornography. It, it, it could be drugs. It could be alcohol. It could be exercising. Right? Some of us run through our manager. We just keep ourselves busy. We clutter ourselves with other people. We clutter ourselves uh, with work. We clutter ourselves with so many so that we do not have to think about it. We don't have to feel it. But all that really does is it exiles the shame that we feel, and it does what shame wants for you not to know that it exists. And not only does shame want you to not know that it exists, it wants you to break off relationships. It wants you to escape away from community. Because in isolation, in hiding, the narrative that shame tells us begins to become even more and more complex. It becomes more and more real. Then now we begin to say, well, yeah, they, they're not real Christians. They don't really love people. That group of people, they're very judgmental. Now we begin to see that there's, all, there's something wrong with everybody else as well. And because everybody else is wrong too, then we shouldn't be with those type of people. That's part of the narrative that shame uses so that we can hide, so that we can avoid community. But if we want to break free of the power of shame, then we need to call shame out. We need to say, that is shame there that's speaking to me. Not only do we need to call out, I think we need to tell other people too that I feel deeply ashamed about this. It took me a long time to realize what I was feeling ashamed of. It took me a long time to fully talk about it. What was troubling me 
wasn't the fact that a church plan was failing or succeeding. What was troubling me and the reason why I felt so ashamed about church plant was deep down, the truth was I feel incapable. And that's been kind of like the narrative of my life. That I didn't feel I was good enough. If I was good enough, then when I was a child, maybe my parents would pay attention to me. If, if I was good enough, maybe I would have been recognized for all of my achievements I've made in throughout my life. If I was good enough, people may actually like me and care for me. That if I was good enough, when I walk into the room, everybody would want to know me. That's the narrative of all my life. Shame. And it has warped my perception of my identity. And so I call that out. <laughs> I have to speak it. I have to call out what I feel. I have to say it. When I'm talking to my friend and they ask me about how a church plant, you know what, I feel, I don't feel very good because I feel like I'm failing. And the reason why I feel I'm failing is I feel I'm not good enough for this. I don't need them to tell me how not good I'm not. That's not the point. I need it for it to come out to the surface. And I need to not avoid people because of shame. I need not to avoid community because of shame. Your shame wants to isolate us and destroy us. Christ has already made a promise. Is that when he died on the cross, he covered our sins. He covered our shame. But we have to access it. The first thing to realize, to access the healing that comes with Christ, is to recognize and to call out shame for what it is, because it is silent. It doesn't want you to know that it exists, because it is the preferred weapon of choice of the enemy. What are the things that you feel ashamed of? How has shame assaulted you? How have you been victimized by shame? What are the areas of your life that you feel that you are not good, that you're not good enough? Because the reality is this. You and I are made in the likeness of Christ that we've been covered by Christ, his righteousness. We are no longer dirty in God's eyes. We've been covered by Christ. That's the truth. And why do we still feel unworthy? Why do we still feel that we're not good enough, that we have something that we need to have in order to validate that I am good. It's because you are a victim of shame. And any victim of abuse will tell you this. The path to freedom is to call it out. Half the freedom is to call, in, to call it out. Because when we call it out for what it is, we're allowing Christ to close us with his righteousness, with his love. 
is Christ says, you are already good enough because I died for you. You have a purpose. You have an identity. You have gifts that I have given to you. You have an inheritance which I have given to you that you did not even have to work for. You don't need to earn it. I have already given you those things because you are worthy. You are good enough. If we want to claim that, then we need to expose the shame. Stop running away from people. Stop running away from the community. Stop running away and isolating yourself. Because if you do, that's shame. And uh, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I, I got it all right when it comes to shame. Because as I look back at my own life story, and as I look back at, quote unquote, the things that I have accomplished in my life, I know I'm good. At least that's what I should know. I walked out of, through the fires of depression, and I didn't quit. I walked out through the fires of grief, and I didn't quit. I walked out through the fires of a church split, and I didn't quit. If that doesn't do enough for you, I was a former gangster who was a high school dropout. And I've done post-grad work. Not bad for a guy who has a GED. I should be feeling proud, validated. Because I have all these pieces of papers on my walls. But I don't always feel that. And what I've learned is that when I start feeling not good about myself, I would tend to drift off in isolation. I don't want to talk about it. I want to hide. I want to avoid. I just want to be by myself. And what I've come to learn is this, that when that happens, I'm in the full grips of shame. That whatever things that God tells me, I don't believe, is I feel not good enough. I have prayed and I have cast out demons. I have prayed and I've seen people being healed before my very eyes. I have seen the full authority of Christ living in me, exercised through me. But when shame comes, I feel I can't do anything because I'm not good enough. And so I need to change the narrative because whatever the narrative shame is painting is not true. And I need to step forward in front of everybody and saying, you know what? I feel deeply ashamed, not of anyone in this room. I feel deeply ashamed because I feel that I failed. I feel that I'm not good enough to be the pastor of this church. I'm not good enough to be the head of my household. I'm not good enough to be friends with people. Because if I was, then everything else would be different. That's the narrative I believe. Here's the narrative that Christ tells me. 
I love you. I made you. No one else told you to plant this church but me. No one can tell you if you're a success or a failure except me. Jesus says, I'm good enough. And I need to step out of my hiddenness and bring that at the table. Because that's when I'm allowing Christ to clothe me. Shame is silent. Shame is deadly. Shame wants to alter the true narrative and make us hide and isolate away from community. So if you want to punch shame in the mouth, come out of hiding. When all of a sudden you feel like you want to avoid a topic, guess what? That is a sh that's shame at work right there. When you don't want to talk about what's happening with you and how you feel, shame happening right there. The other thing that shame does, it blames other people. If that person didn't do this, I won't be so mad. If this didn't happen, I won't be like this. No, no, no. Yes, the things that they did hurt you, but shame was already present in your life when you were born. They're not the cause of your shame. They're the one that actually touched the shame and made you felt it. But shame was always there. And what Christ has told us is this. If we want to be clothed by him, it always starts with repentance. Because the truth is, whenever we believe that we're not good enough, we're sinning. Because God says, this is who we are. But we said, no, I'm this. Then who's God? I want to invite the worship team to come up. And so, if you have been a victim of shame and if you've been assaulted by shame, the first step to freedom is to acknowledge that is what took place. That it happened. And the truth is, it did happen. It happened to Adam and Eve. And it's the weapon of choice of the enemy. And yes, things in our life may have resurfaced a lot of that. But shame was always present. Call it out for what it is. Reclaim our identity. And so as the worship team is leading us in a time uh, of, of worship, just get yourself in the presence of the Lord and ask yourself the question, what are the areas of my life in which I feel that I'm not good enough? And as God is revealing that to you, I want to challenge you. You should tell someone. You should tell someone. It's going to feel awkward. It's going to feel painful. You're going to feel so vulnerable. Because shame wants to desperately 
grasp you in his grips and he's going to use everything in his power to hold you there. It wants to put doubts in your mind. What, what, if, what if this person thinks differently of me? What if they no longer receive me? So Holy Spirit, come. We invite you to come and reveal to us the things that has held us back for so long. We ask that you will show us the shame that we feel, the things that we've been hiding for so long, so that we may be clothed by your righteousness, clothed by your love, clothed by your healing and redemption and restoration. And so I want to bless you with these words from the prophet Isaiah. In chapter 61, these are the words that were spoken by the Lord. It says, instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. This is the promise that Christ has given to us. That we are, when we are clothed by Him, we need to no longer be ashamed. We no longer need to be victimized by shame. And so I bless you as you leave. Do not succumb to the power of shame by keeping you silent. Get up and fight. Expose it. And you will be set free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.